Good afternoon and welcome to RUSI in London. My name is Neil Melvin and I'm the Director of International Security Studies. Today's event is devoted to studying a strategic area of the Russian Federation, namely the Far East, a region that's often overlooked, nonetheless is gaining in importance, not least with the rise of China and the establishment of the Indo-Pacific as a security space. So it's really, this is uh, Russia's uh, window on the Asia Pacific. The event is also uh, taking place to coincide with the launch of a recently uh, produced RUSI report, namely Problems of Geography, Military and Economic Transport Logistics in Russia's Far East, and forms part of our commitment at RUSI to look at this key region, which is both an entry point to the uh, Asia Pacific region, but also to Russia's Arctic areas. Today we have two speakers who will uh, be uh, commenting on this region and its prospects. The first is Dr. Natasha Kurt, lecturer in international peace and security at King's College. Uh, someone who's written widely about the region and in particular about Russia's foreign and security policies in the Asia Pacific region. And then uh, uh, Emily Ferris, a research fellow in Eurasia and Russian affairs at RUSI and the author of the report I mentioned before. Following the, the presentations of the two uh, speakers, we will then open the floor to questions from the audience. And could I request that everyone uses the question and answer function on Zoom to pose questions? So with that, I'd now like to pass uh, the microphone to Natasha Kurt to uh, make her presentation. Thank you, Neil. And thank you to everybody at RUSI for inviting me today. As Neil correctly pointed out, this is an overlooked region, um, or it tends to be, if you like, um, sandwiched or squeezed between discussions of Russia and China. But really, um, you know, its importance um, tends to be sidelined and marginalised um, in the academic literature. But also, um, I think this is very has been very characteristic of Moscow's view of its own region in the past. Um, so I think we can summarize Moscow's approach to the region um, in Soviet times as um, a garrison and a cash cow. So it was obviously a very important region always in military terms, given its geopolitical uh, situation um, with four of the regions in the Russian Far East bordering China. And I think then if we look at what Gorbachev tried to do with the need, the pressing need to demarcate the border with China, this gave a kind of impetus to um, renewing relations with China, improving relations with China, but also looking more broadly at the Asia Pacific region. Um, and then particularly with the kind of um, proposals for modernization and of the economy um, under perestroika, um, I think then Japan actually became in some ways was seen as the more important player. And then with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, I think we should perhaps remember that it wasn't necessarily inevitable that China was going to become the main kind of interlocutor, if you like, of Russia in the Asia Pacific region, um, because um, there were uh, concerted efforts to improve relations with Japan, but the stumbling block of the islands and so on, um, you know, which I won't go into in detail now, but essentially, you know, I think there was a hope that there could be some kind of deal reached essentially on the islands, which would actually result in a kind of big injection of finance into the Asia Pacific, uh, sorry, into the Far Eastern region of Russia. Um, you know, given the kind of apparent complementarity of Japan uh, and Russia. Um, but what happened instead was that, like I said, um, these talks failed and essentially probably by about 92, 93, um, it was really China that came to seem, um, you know, the sort of more important partner in some ways by default. Also the need to sell weapons to China to get um, foreign currency and so on, and also to save the military industrial complex, um, much of which um, was located in the Russian Far Eastern region. So the kind of early plans to sort of maybe modernize the Far Eastern region, um, you know, a kind of um, rather over-optimistic um, sense that maybe they could kind of um, transition to a different type of economy, to manufacturing and so on, 
I think these hopes were were dashed, obviously not only in that region, but it was it it particularly highlighted the fact that this region had always been so very focused on um, on security, um, you know, and so I think that then the relationship with China, the growing relationship with China in the 1990s into the 2000s, um, kind of in a way was credited with saving um, the Russian defense industry, but I think it also um, meant that plans to sort of try and, um, you know, uh, change the nature of the economy in the Russian Far East from a from kind of concentration on raw materials, um, defense and so on, um, also came to grief um, in the sense that, um, you know, the, the rents that could also be siphoned off, I think, from some of these industries um, were obviously attractive. Um, and so, although um, there have been some uh, improvements, I think, in the Russian Far East, particularly in the terms of infrastructure, which Emily, I think, will detail in her talk. Um, I think that the kind of so-called pivot to the East, which was announced in 2012, um, which had the socio-economic development of the Russian Far East at its center, um, has really um, not um, been able to combat the um, multiple problems of this region. Um, and the problems of this region, I think many people are familiar um, with the fact that there is a very low um, population, a very small population, about 6 million or so at the current estimate. Um, I think in 1990, there were about 8 million in the region. And of course, um, geopoliticians like to point out that over the border in China, um, the population is much, much higher. Of course, this is true. And in the 1990s, there was a lot of um, political capital made out of that, in fact, by the regional governors who used these kind of fears of Chinese influx um, as a kind of bargaining chip with the centre. Um, I think that's really not been the case for quite some time. And actually, these Chinese workers coming over the border um, have decreased massively. And now what we're seeing are um, mainly Central Asian workers um, in the region. So, so you know, the sort of um, demographics of the region have changed, um, but the Russian population is always on the decrease. Um, now, this pivot to Asia, pivot to the East, um, which began in 2012, so actually before um, the Crimean episode, um, this had a program for the socioeconomic development of the Russian Far East as uh, part and parcel of it, but it was also meant to um, incorporate a kind of push towards economic integration with the Asia Pacific region. Um, now, um, this was really um, something that um, was seen as a big priority at the time. Um, and the Asia Pacific region obviously was seen as, you know, one of the most dynamic power centers of the world. And I think the 2008 financial crisis uh, for Russia really showed the kind of resilience of the Asia Pacific region and the need to re-engage with that region. Um, and essentially the uh, Russian government suggested that the welfare of the whole country depended on the government's ability to solve the geopolitical, strategic, economic, and development problems of the Russian Far East. Um, so, you know, they really are showing how the economic and social development of the Russian Far East um, is treated um, as inherently linked to the Asia Pacific. Um, and I think uh, the governor of Khabarovsk Krai, um, who, late, Ishayev, uh, who later became um, the plenipotentiary for the region, um, warned uh, repeatedly that the Russian Far Eastern region uh, risked at this time actually becoming um, a kind of uh, dual or double periphery so that it would be cut off from the rest of Russia, but that it would also be cut off from dynamic economic developments in the Asia Pacific region. Um, so I just wanted to highlight the fact that, you know, we need to remember that the Russian Far East um, has always been very much, um, or for a long time, been very much seen as part and parcel of a kind of wider, um, you know, wider Asia Pacific policy. But I think that over time, for all sorts of reasons, um, you know, China has become the, the main player um, and the main uh, 
the main interlocutor, obviously, as we know, because of talk of an alliance with China and so on, but also particularly in the Russian Far East, we see how the trade of some of these regions uh, with China is incredibly high, um, and particularly the Amur region um, for probably over a decade now, nearly all of their um, exports, nearly all of their trade turnover is with China. So I think last year it was about 83%. Um, which is a staggering figure. So in a way that region is kind of wholly dependent essentially more or less on Chinese, on trade with China. And of course, uh, then we have the um, whole discussion about um, the Russian Far East and Russia as a raw materials appendage of China, um, because by far the majority um, of Russian exports to China and particularly from the Russian Far East are of course hydrocarbons and raw materials. And yet this warning um, has been sounding, this alarm bell, if you like, has been sounding for well over 10 years or longer, um, but nobody actually uh, does much about it. Um, and I think there are probably particular reasons for that. Um, so, um, so I think if you look at it in the, in the round in terms of, um, Russia's so-called Asia-Pacific policy, there was this kind of attempt in around 2012 um, to broaden Russia's uh, Asia policy, but I think that, um, you know, certain realities have made that difficult to do, to bring to fruition. Um, and I think that also we have to factor in, um, you know, the, the region is inhospitable, the region, um, you know, doesn't um, facilitate investment. It's very difficult to invest there. It's not um, a welcoming environment for investors. Um, and so I think um, there's still a lot of work to do on that front. And then I'll leave the detail of that, I think, and um, on infrastructure and so on to Emily. Thanks very much, Natasha. I mean, as you highlighted the uh, Russian Far East, it's a vast region. I mean, it's stretching from, from Siberia to the Pacific, from the Arctic to Mongolia and China. Uh, it's also, I mean, very far in terms of time zones from Moscow, which, which means that infrastructure has been central to, to Russia's plans to maintain close ties. And, and this is the subject of the report that uh, Rusi has, has just published. And uh, I'd now like to pass to Emily Ferris, the author of that report, to comment on, on these issues. Emily. Thanks very much, Neil, and uh, thanks very much, Natasha, also for your, for your brilliant introduction to that region, really. Um, I think, um, you know, as we've mentioned, this is, this is discussing uh, a paper that we recently published, um, which broadly looks at things like Russian strategic geography. So the way it thinks about um, both its economic and its military security in the Far East, given, as Neil just mentioned, this very vast territory, um, but also where transport infrastructure factors into that conversation. So um, one of the main arguments of that paper really um, is looking at Russia's security, military and economic ambitions in the Far East, uh, and why really the concept of transport infrastructure and logistics is quite often overlooked. Um, as a key vulnerability that is really restricting a lot of Russia's ambitions and goals in the Far East and, and also Asia Pacific region. Um, so I think as we've, uh, we've already really reiterated, I think we think this is a topic that's not given enough attention, um, even though I think there's quite recent events in the news cycle, even uh, things like the protests in Khabarovsk uh, over the regional government, uh, and then this kind of recent uh, contamination of uh, water in Kamchatka, all of this kind of indicates that, um, you know, the Far East is a relatively uh, occasionally volatile region, there's high protest potential, and the region's needs and interests are actually very different to Moscow's, and I think are rather poorly understood by Moscow itself. Um, so when, when we're referring to things like transport infrastructure, um, this is really kind of roads, rail and port systems. Um, and whilst these things obviously have a, a kind of social function, you know, they link up uh, villages and towns and things like that. Um, I think they also have three main important roles uh, in Russia. So um, the first is, um, as Natasha sort of um, touched on earlier, um, it's the most efficient way for cargo and also people to move across enormous amounts of Russian territory. And this is particularly important because of Russia's 
um, economic reliance on the production and export of uh, raw materials, um, things like uh, coal, for example. The second reason is that this network uh, is very important to bridge Russia's eastern and western regions uh, and linking them up to China and Japan as an important trade partner. And the third re uh, reason uh, is as a military function. So uh, to defend uh, Russia's borders in the Far Eastern region, maintaining Russia's status as a military power, and also training very specific types of engineering troops using railways uh, in challenging terrain in the Far East, which I will obviously um, go into in a little bit more detail. Um, but first I was going to speak a little bit about some of Russia's economic uh, ambitions and also challenges in the Far East. Um, so as we've mentioned, very reliant on uh, the export of natural resources. There's numerous strategies in place to upgrade all of this transport infrastructure. Um, you know, various agencies, Ministry of Transport, then a specific development strategy for the Far East itself. Um, there's a specific um, Far East and Development Agency. There's a lot of funding apportioned to it, um, but there's a lot of problems organizationally. Um, so the way that funding is distributed is quite uh, uneven. And uh, there are plenty of very remote areas in the Far East that are actually quite resource rich, um, but they've been allocated relatively few financial resources to improve all of these roads and rail and port links, which means that if a, a large mining company in a place like Kamchatka uh, is trying to increase its productivity, uh, there's usually very few roads, um, air services are very infrequent, it means lots of gaps in supply chains and all of that makes it very uneconomic at the moment and very unexpedient to be investing in that region. So one of the other kind of problems is, is the usual uh, strategic planning issues. So there's disagreements within government departments about what funding should look like. Um, I should also caveat that this is, yes, this is a Russian problem, but also it is very difficult to sort out a strategy uh, for this region. Numerous administrations, um, as Natasha mentioned, have tried to do this um, and failed. Uh, and the Kremlin's approach tends to be to have uh, these very large investment projects or big infrastructure projects that kind of mask um, a, a, the lack of real planning. Um, so they tend to be sort of um, much touted uh, in the press, but they tend to come to very little, uh, usually as a result of kind of corrupt practices as well, which obviously doesn't uh, help. We can certainly discuss that more in the questions if, if people are interested in sort of the, the very specific uh, issues in Russia's business environment. Um, but, but certainly without any kind of systematic investment in infrastructure or kind of establishing proper logistical centers to support the plans that the government has in place, um, you know, the Far East is going to be a, a little bit more of a drain on the economy rather than a, a boost, I think. Um, and certainly this all links into the discussion about uh, Japan and China and other investors like South Korea, because the Russian government is fully aware that it will not be able to afford many of these large investment projects without foreign assistance. So this is why you see things like the Eastern Economic Forum, which is held every year, um, although it was cancelled this year, of course, um, you know, to attract investors from the Asia Pacific region, um, especially in infrastructure and deals that prioritize investments in things like ports are really important for Russia. But I think that uh, I will also talk about some of the three, what I see as the three main challenges to developing transport infrastructure specifically. So I think that really comes down to geography, demography and education. Um, so first, you know, geographically, climate is very important. Um, it means that uh, transport costs are very expensive. It makes developing the Far East really difficult. Um, construction is very challenging in terrain that is mountainous uh, or permafrost or sometimes entirely marshy in summer, which uh, can kind of impact on the way that railways could be, could be laid. Um, so that makes it very challenging. Um, then the demographic issue, which Natasha has mentioned before, it's, it's you know, six million people or so, maybe closer to seven now, I think, with, with recent demographic changes in the Far East. Um, in comparison to the Western part of Russia, which has a, a much larger population, which makes sense. Uh, most of Russia's kind of trade was orientated towards Europe um, before that. Um, but the other problem is also just demographics within the Far East itself. 
Um, so there's a lot of uh, people comparatively in the Primorsky region bordering China, but not in other parts of the Far East, um, which are kind of things like the uh, Jewish Autonomous Republic are sort of seen as, uh, you know, much smaller and perhaps less relevant, even though a lot of these places have very high trade volumes with um, China. Um, and then there's the education aspect. Um, there's very few research institutes in Russia that are just devoted to infrastructure um, or rail construction. And none of these are in the far east of Russia. They're mainly in the west, uh, which makes it very difficult. Um, then you've got sort of just more, more general problems with trying to improve infrastructure, which is that the government's approach tends to be to increase capacity uh, along the two main routes. Obviously, the first is the Trans-Siberian. Uh, and the Baikal Amur mainline, known as the, the BAM line, um, which runs parallel to the Trans-Siberian and up north and connects with other regions in the Far East. Um, but a lot of those railways are already running at full capacity. So there actually isn't really much scope to just add more rail cars. So a lot of these promised kind of increases in trade with Asia Pacific regions and coal production might actually be in jeopardy as a result. Um, so the final point that I wanted to very briefly make was about the military aspect of infrastructure. So we know that infrastructure plays a very important role uh, as part of military logistics. Russia is very aware of the importance of uh, developing a very strong military logistical infrastructure to support the troops that it has. Um, and the Far East is actually very important as a training ground for the armed forces. So to learn how to deal with very difficult terrain, as we mentioned earlier, so mountains and rivers, um, there's often lots of military exercises in that region that specifically focus on constructing bridges uh, or river fording during things like war theater scenarios where those are taken out. Um, and so even though uh, I think Russia is quite aware that the risk of an actual conflict um, on the borders with the Far East with any of those uh, neighboring countries is actually quite low, um, I think the history here is actually very important. Um, so borders in that region have moved very frequently um, parts of the Far East were under Chinese jurisdiction before. There's a long history of those conflicts with some of those neighbours. Um, and so because of that, I think there is still this, this sense of needing to defend those borders. Um, and then you have people like the Chief of Staff, Valery Gerasimov, who has expressed concerns that um, if Russia is not able to improve some of its logistical uh, military shortcomings, um, that the armed forces might be at risk of... Um, less positive development. So you can see that there's quite a lot of training of people like the railway engineering troops. Um, this is a kind of auxiliary force. Um, they help uh, the, the main armed forces to uh, ensure communications and uh, resources moving from uh, the rear of um, military action to the front. Um, and they're really quite essential. They've been used in lots of um, conflicts before. Um, so they assist the ground forces, they've been used in, in Georgia, in Syria, during Crimea in 2014, um, and a lot of the things that they do, like constructing uh, railways and bridges um, very quickly, um, is something that's extremely important for Russian military supplies. Um, we can see there's quite a lot of investment in training these troops, um, there's certainly a lot of money going to it, it's a key priority, but um, you know, whilst this obviously does suggest that they're going to become increasingly important in Russia's strategic security thinking, um, the fact that a lot of their equipment hasn't been upgraded as suggested uh, might be an issue further down the line. So I think just to, to sort of conclude there, um, I think all of these, these military and economic issues show um, how important logistics are in Russia's thinking, but it also actually raises questions about the financial and political expediency of developing this region. And so how committed is, do we see Moscow being to actually implementing these plans? How viable are they? What's going to happen if all of this promised funding doesn't actually appear? And I think more fundamentally, uh, it's, it's not clear how well Moscow actually understands the Far East's specific needs. Uh, and I think that might create quite a lot of tensions uh, in the next few years. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we're starting to get a few questions in, but perhaps I can uh, just start things rolling with a question to each of you. Uh, Natasha, you, you raised the sort of the Moscow's pivot to the Asia Pacific region 
uh, starting in, in 2012. Uh, of course, from a European perspective, we often see this very much as a response to deterioration of relations uh, on the European side, particularly post the Crimea annexation. My, so my question really is to what extent does Russia's weakness in the Far East actually serve as a driver for its engagement in the wider Asia Pacific region, i.e. that because the, as we've heard from, uh, from Emily's description of the, of the serious problems that Russia has in developing, it's increasingly reliant on the Asia Pacific as a development model. So how much of, of those needs actually are shaping Russia's uh, position on the Asia Pacific and the kind of relationships that it's seeking to build up and maybe also limiting Russia's options as a result of that. And, and my question to you, Emily, is uh, I, th I think you begin your report with this, uh, this famous quote from Google about the, uh, the eternal, the two eternal problems of, of Russia being fools and rogues. And, and that sort of hints that the there are long running issues in Russian development model, which have plagued many regions, including the Far East. And I mean, I remember even in the 1990s, many of these issues uh, that we're talking about were on the agenda. Uh, concern about demographic future, about deterioration of infrastructure. Is there a tipping point in Russia's internal infrastructure and its relationship with the Far East that will actually mean that it begins to lose its ability to manage the area, to maintain its sovereignty uh, and, and all these sorts of issues? Or do you just see a sort of a gradual uh, ongoing, uh, well, either a status quo or, or a degree of, sort of further decay in the relationship between Moscow and the region? So perhaps, uh, Natasha, do you want to, to go first? And then I'll, I'll go back to some of the questions that we're getting in on the question and answer function. Yeah, thank you, Neil. Um, I mean, I think uh, the sort of idea of the development of the Russian Far East, as Emily noted, um, has gone in fits and starts. And, you know, Gorbachev already announced a development plan for the Russian Far East. And then Yeltsin as well had at least one, if not two different iterations of a development plan. And, you know, we will fulfill the plan, etc. But each time the plan was not fulfilled and, you know, um, it sort of became uh, fairly ephemeral, really. Um, and, you know, we've had the same problem as well with um, plans announced by Putin for the gasification and economic development of the Russian Far East. and. I mean, there was initially an idea that there would be a kind of cross-border cooperation between the sort of Russian Far Eastern regions and their kind of corresponding regions in China. Um, and this was apparently a kind of, um, you know, pet plan of the Chinese president. Um, but it seems as if that part has really fallen away, essentially, um, over time. Um, I mean, you know, speak, just speaking anecdotally to Russians from the region and to academics working on the area, um, you know, it seems that really um, the Russian Far Eastern region, um, you know, is not a priority in the way that it may have been before. And that this, I mean, this whole idea of cooperation across the border hasn't really come to fruition. It hasn't worked. And I mean, there are multiple reasons why it hasn't worked, ranging from corruption to, um, you know, kind of Chinese accusations of sort of essentially Russia uh, just kind of stalling on various issues and just essentially making uh, life difficult in terms of actually getting, making any headway economically, um, you know, and I think that's, that actually has often been a complaint coming from China that Russia makes life difficult, you know, it doesn't, um, provide the right investment conditions and you know this is going back 20 years or more it doesn't provide the right investment conditions um, you know it stopped obviously there was a lot of cross-border trade when the border first opened in 1990 um, you know nothing ever since then um, you know the Chinese kind of have a very different view of economics and how it should work you know um, so all that kind of shuttle trade and kind of spontaneous uncontrolled trade um, it's sort of part and parcel of Chinese economic life, but you know, for Russia, this is something has always been something quite threatening to its security. You know, and it clamped down heavily on that kind of um, 
you know, unmonitored, uncontrolled trade in the 1990s. And I think since for about the last 10 years or more, it's been very difficult for Chinese to get visas to go to Russia. Um, you know, they can get very temporary visas, um, but they cut, they kind of clamped down on all of the kind of, um, you know, Chinese mark Chinese run markets and so on in the Russian Far East and um, you know that's obviously on a smaller scale but um, you know there are often problems on a bigger scale as well economically. Um, so I mean my sense is that the Russian Far East, the development of the Russian Far East is no longer really driving Russia's Asia policy. Um, obviously since sanctions came in and since Crimea um, you know the Asian dimension if you like of Russia's um, uh, sorry, the Chinese dimension of Russia's Asia policy has accelerated, essentially because China, although it doesn't really invest much, um, it is able to provide loans for energy projects and so on. Um, and obviously then uh, with the BRI as well, although it's a bit of a moot point as to how much Russia will actually benefit from the BRI. Um, but there are issues around railways and so on, which Emily might want to comment on there. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think, you know, Neil, in response to your question, obviously, a lot of the problems are long standing problems that are not new. The disorganization in government, um, government departments not speaking to each other, a strategy that's not adhered to squabbling over funding, all of these are not new problems for Russia. Um, I think the, you know, the question really is, as far as the Far East is concerned is, is it different this time? Is, is Moscow's kind of new revamped turn to this region anything different than what we've seen before? And I think a lot of the old problems such as Moscow not quite knowing what the Far East needs. So you can see that really clearly in some of the protests in Khabarovsk, um, you know, the way that, um, you know, the Kremlin kind of responded by inserting a replacement governor who was sure still from the Liberal Democratic Party, but somebody who was also very controversial, um, somebody who certainly didn't uh, quell the protests in the way that I think the government wanted. It sort of shows how out of touch they are with what, what really needs to happen. Um, so that's, that's the first issue. Um, I don't think there's any kind of fundamental risk of, I mean, real separatism or any kind of the region pulling away so dramatically from the Kremlin or anything like that. Um, and I think, you know, just exacerbating the existing very poor relationship between them and Moscow is probably the most likely way forward. Um, but then again, if you look at the way that some of the, um, the Far Eastern development strategies this time have been laid out, um, some of the new governors that have come in and have really tried to improve their regions, um, some of them are actually quite good. I mean, you know, there's people like the, the governor of the Amor region um, who speaks Chinese and has tried really hard to push for Chinese foreign investment. Um, there's always the danger that these governors get a little bit too popular, um, a little bit uh, too independent. Uh, and then I think the Kremlin doesn't always know how to deal with it. And they do tend to then clamp down on that. And that really risks exacerbating that problem. So actually, if some of these governors were allowed the autonomy to improve their region economically, if they were given the financial resources and the staff and, uh, you know, some of the some of the free reign to actually improve it, um, then that would probably improve the relationship with the Kremlin. But actually, the Kremlin is so so concerned that these governors will become too too independent from the party that they are not willing to do that. Uh, and I think that is that is an increasing problem now that's relatively new. Thanks. Uh, there's quite a few questions coming in about the this key issue I think you both touched on, which is the issue of demography uh, as, a, as a central issue that needs to be resolved if Russia is indeed to, to maintain its, uh, its position in the Russian Far East. So Madeleine Moon raises the issue of the possibility of workers coming from North Korea. What are the problems associated with this uh, workforce? And of course, we did have a large uh, Korean migration in the late 19th, early 20th century, and uh, of course they were then deported by Stalin. Uh, but um, so there's a, a bit of a track record in that area. Uh, another source, of course, is is people moving from European Russia, and uh, uh, there's a question uh, about uh, from Mark Barton about how Russia is uh, 
is trying to encourage uh, internal migration. Of course, we have the uh, so-called homestead uh, law uh, that Putin introduced, so we could perhaps we comment on that. And, and a third dimension, I think, is, is, is this issue about, given the, the ever-declining population and the aging population, how long will Russia persist with investing in infrastructure when it has pressing concerns elsewhere as regards its resources? So at what point will it become very difficult, I suppose, to justify large infrastructure projects when you have a really tiny population in the, in the Far East? Does anyone, uh, is that perhaps Emily, do you want to comment on, on that issue? Perhaps you want to come in, Natasha? Um, sure, so I think just on the, um, the migration into the Far East, um, certainly there have been quite a lot of um, initiatives from the government to encourage people to move. Um, there's things like the Far East and Hector scheme that was set up um, to basically give people in other parts of Russia land in the Far East if for free if they chose to move there. And actually most of the uptake of that scheme has been locals in the Far East who are interested in expanding their own land ownership. Um, there's been loads of bureaucratic problems with uh, getting the uh, land register sorted, um, people saying that the land actually is a poor quality than they thought, so they can't really um, farm on it um, as they expected to. So that's not really worked as a, as a major scheme to encourage people to move. Um, then in terms of the, the DPRK, well, um, because of the UN sanctions, um, a lot of the uh, North Korean workers that were engaged in particularly logging in the Far East were technically moved um, and have not been, I mean, officially on the books, are, are not allowed to return. But um, I think just, just anecdotally, I think we're quite aware that that um, is probably still going on. There's certainly been a lot of very well publicized use of North Korean labor in things like the FIFA World Cup. Um, there were lots of uh, their workers involved in construction, lots of human rights issues and abuses that were very well reported by people like um, Amnesty International. Um, and um, then I guess on the other demographic issue, the uh, declining population in general, I think, I think that Russia will always be investing in infrastructure in some form or other. Um, this is partly because it has to placate quite a lot of powerful business people in lots of different industries. Um, so the coal mining industries in particular, and things like Russian railways, um, the sort of semi but mainly state controlled company that controls most of the network. Um, this means that it makes it very difficult for the government to kind of make sure they, they take it all of these kind of political and business interests into account. So you'll see often that Putin meets with the head of Russian railways and will promise more rail cars. He'll promise um, that there will always be these investments. And because of these personal relationships, I find it very unlikely um, that that demographics would be the reason to drive a lack of investment in infrastructure. It would much more likely be a change in some of those relationships and some of those tensions. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Emily's sort of covered quite a bit. I mean, the obviously the homestead scheme has only just been enacted uh, very recently, but they were talking about such a scheme already in about 2010, 2011. Um, they, I mean, I think they already they set up um, some kind of scheme. It had a different name, um, you know, quite some time ago. But practically nobody, um, you know, wanted to actually take up the scheme. Um, you know, nobody was really very interested in moving to the Russian Far East. And you know, frankly, why? I mean, in many cases, why would you be? Because you know, um, I think initially the idea was to target um, Russians in Central Asia. Um, you know, Russians leaving Central Asia. I think that was the original idea um, to sort of give them somewhere to go, if you like. Um, as far as Koreans are concerned, um, yeah, I mean, obviously there are the kind of historical, you know, uh, Korean diaspora there uh, that Neil mentioned. Um, and then there's also, there's also um, there have been the um, workers on the illegal in many cases, illegal logging schemes, um, which are controlled mainly by criminals, as far as I know. Um, not all of them, but I mean, I think it's just 
essentially most of the timber industry is now in control of these gangs. Um, and on that point, actually, um, you know, it's interesting that there are very few, um, you know, talking about raw materials and so on, and, and Russia is constantly, you know, saying we need to kind of get back to manufacturing, etc. Um, so, you know, in terms of the timber industry, there are hardly any Russian processing factories, timber processing factories in the Russian Far East, um, you know, um, but there are a very large number of Chinese sawmills by the border. Um, so essentially, I think um, the Chinese are the ones who are actually processing this timber, um, but the Russians obviously providing the actual raw materials. Um, and as Emily said, you know, the deadline, I think the deadline for workers to return was December of last year for Korean workers to return because of the sanctions. So, I mean, you know, I think for now there, there isn't going to be a rise in, in Korean workers, um, you know, although there are obviously maybe people under the radar, um, but um, it's an interesting point in, you know, where, uh, where will they get the workers from for that industry? Because, I mean, obviously the Korean workers have paid a pittance. So, you know, the kind of profit margins presumably were fairly high. So um, I'm not sure who you could replace them with. Um, obviously there are Central Asians in the region who are increasing in number in terms of the labor force, but I'm not sure of the exact figures. Um, and just in terms of demographics, um, there is actually um, a kind of general uh, demographic decline uh, just in the last year in Russia, but I don't know what the details are for the Russian Far East. Um, but, you know, there's um, a rise in mortality and a decline in fertility, um, which is affecting the whole of the Russian population. Okay, then I think we've got another sort of set of questions, which are really about uh, the linking between the Russian Far East and the Arctic region, and whether this is a, a new dynamic that uh, may allow new possibilities. So Vitaly Boldyrev uh, raises, I think, the point that much of the infrastructure, of course, is very important, it is coastal infrastructure, and there is an opportunity around Vladivostok and the Hodka to develop this uh, link between Asia-Pacific region and Russia's ambition for the Northern Sea Route. Uh, but then, of course, we, th this would reinforce the coastal aspects of the Russian Far East and perhaps wouldn't answer some of the internal is issues around depopulation infrastructure. So perhaps you could comment on that. And then there was also, I think, a, perhaps a linked question uh, right at the beginning from Alex Fultz about the issue of climate change and how this may affect uh, development issues. And of course, climate change is, is opening up the Arctic. It also may be damaging some areas. We've seen problems in the north, northern areas around permafrost, damaging buildings as it begins to melt, making it very difficult to build infrastructure. So perhaps you could also comment on how you see climate change playing in both plus and, and negatives to the prospects of development uh, of, of the region. Uh, Emily, would you like to go first? Sure, yes. Yeah. So um, I think those questions are really useful in raising, I think, what are quite fundamental problems with um, connecting the Far East to the Arctic. So you can certainly see in the way that the government has organized things like the Far East Development Agency, the Arctic is also under that remit. So obviously that suggests that to the Kremlin, this is uh, two regions that are linked um, and one will depend on the other. But from what I can see, uh, most of the development plans, as, as um, the person who asked the question noted, um, are still quite fragmented. Um, a lot of government departments have raised problems with trying to link up things like the Nahodka port and um, Vladivostok to ports along the NSR um, and have said that it's financially not viable. It's very difficult to do. Um, you've got ports that are under, that aren't uh, that are iced all year round and even with climate change it's not going to be so dramatic in the next few years that these ports will be completely ice free which means that you have to invest in icebreakers and Russia's shipbuilding capabilities are notoriously very poor even though they are trying to upgrade them um, Russia does not have um, that many icebreakers under construction or under renovation or anything so that will make it very difficult to take advantage of that um, the other thing you have to consider is that to build a port is 
really an investment of about 30 or 40 years. It's not um, something that can be constructed very quickly. Uh, it requires a lot of investment, including foreign investment. And then that really just goes back to the question of how willing uh, foreign investors are to put their money to these kinds of projects. And the answer is not very, because if you look at how many, specifically how many deals have fallen through with Chinese and South Korean investors in port infrastructure in the last few years, um, I mean, there's lots of plans, there's lots of feasibility studies that have been done about, um, you know, how viable it is to invest in, um, say, upgrading the Nakhodka port in particular, but actually, after kind of uh, going through the numbers, um, a lot of the foreign investors decide that it's not worth it. And um, that might be for a number of reasons. Um, corruption certainly plays a role. It might also be, as has been suggested before, um, that they're not convinced that these ports are going to be used. Um, there isn't a guarantee that these ports will accept suddenly a huge amount of new traffic, um, that there'll be a sudden influx in products. So actually to invest potentially millions of dollars uh, in a project that might not be uh, economically useful seems a bit, um, you know, ludicrous. So a lot of these things do fall apart. Um, I think I think that's part of the main the main problem that these things don't happen. Um, so even though Russia is very interested in these things, even though there's obviously strategies and some some Russian money going into um, the upgrading of the ports, you don't see that reflected in reality. And if there's no repair stations along the NSR, if there's no uh, ports that are able to service um, a lot of the increased traffic that, that Russia clearly envisages, um, then I don't see how it's going to be a viable option. Natasha, do you uh, want to come in on this? Yeah, I mean, only, um, I think Emily sort of covered the main points about the ports, but I mean, obviously, yes, um, you know, they have sort of now integrated in a sense, the Russian Far East with the Russian Arctic. Um, you know, so obviously it's kind of stretching from Murmansk to sort of Kamchatka. Um, and, and so I suppose they are kind of seen as kind of converging now in a way that they weren't before. Um, and obviously the Chinese, for example, are very interested. I mean, not only the Chinese, but particularly the Chinese in the Northern Sea Route. And so Russia has kind of very much touted the Northern Sea Route. Um, you know, they've kind of talked about how you know, this year it was completely ice free in September, which it usually hasn't been. So, I mean, you know, clearly climate change is coming and having an effect. Um, but as Emily said, I don't, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and then, you know, you will, I mean, they're kind of trying to say that actually you can get through just with conventional ships because it will be ice free a lot of the time. But I mean, I think, um, you know, that's not a kind of guaranteed scenario. Um, so clearly, you know, they will have to um, invest in icebreakers still, um, you know, and they don't really have enough as yet, as I understand it. Um, but, um, you know, there's also the point about um, LNG, which I mean, I'm not an expert on energy, but, you know, the liquefied natural gas, um, you know, so I think, um, you know, the terminals being uh, installed, uh, set up in the Arctic, but then also I think some to be set up in the Russian Far East, some new terminals. Um, and I believe uh, Sechin, uh, Igor Sechin has um, quite a lot of um, interest um, in these LNG um, terminals. So, um, so, you know, I guess he's kind of backing, you know, many of these projects. Um, so there's Yamal and LNG, for example. Um, but, um, you know, some of these projects that are kind of touted in news articles and so on, then you find that actually they're not really coming. They're not going to be uh, starting even for another two or three years. So, um, you know, so it's kind of difficult to say right now how successful this is going to be. But, you know, obviously in the last four to five years, this dimension, if you like, the kind of Arctic dimension has definitely um, started to kind of converge with the Russian Far Eastern um, dimension. Um, but again, I don't think it's necessarily really so much focused on the actual development of the region in terms of socioeconomic development, but you know, certainly in terms of um, <clears throat> large scale energy projects and so on. Okay, uh, perhaps I could turn then to, to the uh, sort of, as we begin to come to a conclusion of the event, to the issue of security, 
uh, Ellie Copsey raises, uh, I think, this issue in her question, where she asks about the relative priority of Russian security interests between the Far East, Asia Pacific, and uh, what she identifies as a as a bigger threat to Russia, namely from from the European security side. So perhaps I could ask you both about you know, how does this region fit into Russia's security framework? What are Russia's actual security perceptions? I mean, we saw President Putin just last week at the Valdai Club uh, floating the idea that down the road there might be a prospect of a, of a Chinese-Russian military alliance even. So, so do we see a prospect of, of this region actually becoming less significant militarily from the Russian side? Or do you think that they're always likely to want to maintain uh, this space as a significant uh, security space? And what does that then mean for the kind of investment that we've been talking about? And perhaps lastly, how does this fit into to Russia's ambitions to play a larger role in Asia Pacific region, including on the, on the security side? So how important is the Russians actually having a significant security presence in the Far East to their ability to be an actor in this wider region? Uh, Natasha, did, did you want to perhaps uh, begin on that issue? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously there's, um, you know, when we think about Russia, we tend to think about um, its antagonistic relations with the West, um, you know, quite understandably, um, you know, it doesn't really um, single out, it never singles out China very specifically as a threat, or at least it doesn't anymore, you know, go back 10 to 15 years ago and um, you know a number of people did point to China as a threat um, to Russia um, but I mean you know for various reasons obviously partly to do with the kind of um, burgeoning economic relationship but also the kind of ostensibly um, kind of closer relationship in terms of sort of arguably values and so on um, you know it, it doesn't seem as if China really threatens Russia. Um, and yet, you know, um, I think there's still certainly, um, you know, a sense in which um, Russia does need to kind of insulate itself against a hypothetical Chinese threat quite clearly. Um, you know, I mean, obviously the border is not militarized in the sense that it was during the Cold War, um, but, um, you know, Russia has, um, it still uh, focuses on the Russian Far East in terms of uh, military security. Um, for example, the Eastern Military District, which obviously includes the Pacific Fleet, um, was established in 2010. So, you know, it's not as if Russia has kind of downgraded um, the district necessarily, um, but it, it merged the Far Eastern Military District with the Siberian Military District. Um, and so in that, with that move, that meant that essentially the entire um, Chinese border area, apart from a little bit um, in Mongolia, um, was covered now by one military district. I mean, you know, one could be reading too much into it, but, um, you know, for many people, a, a factor behind this restructuring was essentially to have more effective control over the Far Eastern border region. Um, and, um, you know, then they also um, relocated the headquarters of the military district um, to Habarovsk, which obviously is much um, closer to China. I mean, again, you know, maybe one's reading too much into it, but, um, you know, I, I, you know, while obviously there is no kind of necessarily explicit or open discussion of China as a threat, I mean, I think that, there, you know, they still, there is certainly not neglecting um, you know, China in their kind of plans in the Russian Far East. Um, and so, um, you know, it's obviously it's not easy to directly assess the prioritization of the Eastern Military District, you know, in kind of military armament programs and so on. Um, but, you know, I think the Eastern Military District in the last few years has been kind of given greater firepower and, and better equipment and so on. But, um, you know, clearly, you know, obviously military planning is about hypothetical threats and, um, you know, I'm sure that um, defence capacity against a potential Chinese ground invasion isn't completely off the cards, so to speak. Emily? 
Yeah, Emily, do um, yeah, I'd certainly agree that um, that Russia having a military presence in the Far Eastern region doesn't necessarily mean that they think there's some kind of imminent conflict with any of those neighbours, um, but it is ensuring against any kind of possible scenario, which is absolutely what any military would do. Um, that said, I also think that um, the Far East is a very important training ground for a lot of potential conflicts that are not necessarily in the Far Eastern region, but take place in terrain that's relatively similar. So I think the importance of things like the railway engineering troops, so the things that they do, uh, you know, building bridges, um, helping to repair railway lines, given that Russia is still very much a ground forces um, country, um, it invests most of its funding in that rather than say, you know, air force capabilities. Um, obviously, that means that the railways are going to continue to play a really important part in how Russia moves its troops, not only around Russia, but into other conflict zones. Um, so investing in training these railway troops and upgrading their capabilities to be able to move large volumes of um, hardware um, and also troops very quickly into a war, a war scenario um, is really important. So you can see that there is a lot of investment in um, those graduates from very specific um, training institutions. Um, uh, unfortunately, I think in terms of their equipment, um, in terms of the, the state armament program that, that Putin had announced um, and that uh, they're supposed to have upgraded, I don't know, something like 70% of their kit and that's just not been done. Uh, and I think that might be more of a kind of economic and government squabbling issue rather than a kind of lack of interest in actually upgrading them. Um, but you certainly see, I mean, you saw in, in, in the Georgia conflict um, and also in Crimea that the railway troops were really important in laying the groundwork for the troops to do their jobs. And I think are largely credited with um, being able to uh, set up the conflict, you know, on Russia's terms in that way. Um, I think just very briefly in terms of um, things like threats from, from China, there was a lot made of um, the Zapad 2018 military exercises, which featured um, a small contingent of Chinese troops. Um, and on the one hand, I think, um, yes, very politically symbolic and important that, um, that Russia chose to train with, with this small group. But I think also it was kind of uh, designed for Russia to show off what it could do in that region but also to make sure that China did not feel that because Russia was doing a huge military exercise essentially on the borders with China, that this was directed at China. And there is that real risk um, that the actions by Russia, that these snap drills seem to China to be very aggressive. So I think that part of that is Russia being very aware um, that whilst it wants to um, show off its military prowess, it also has to make sure it doesn't look too frightening for China. Um, and, and to throw another thing into the mix, you know, technologically, um, you start to see at things like the uh, annual military expo in Moscow, there's a lot of Chinese technology being featured. A few years ago, that was mainly Belarusian and Russian technology. So now that you're starting to see China emerging as a bit of a competitor to Russia in terms of um, kit, I think uh, Russia is very aware of uh, not showing all of its cards to China immediately. Great. Perhaps we can just take one, one final issue, uh, which I think has come up in the questioning, which is really about uh, the issue, I think, of, of what, the, what the people of the Russian Far East want. And I guess that's been raised by the, the Khabarovsk protests. Uh, I mean, up, in the in, up until the late 1990s, where Russia did op operate as a federation, of course, you had a quite a diversity of, of issues in the Russian Far East from you know, a strong push in places like Amur to build bridge, the bridge across the river to China, which was blocked by Moscow because of security concerns, to actual hostility in places like Primoria to Chinese immigrants and a kind of a local nationalism. So there was a set of diversity, the diversity around the local agendas, but perhaps also a, a better understanding of, of what local politics and development needs were. President Putin constructed his vertical by sort of putting that all under his direct control and the control of his, uh, his federal representatives. So, so my question really is, to what extent do you think it's going to be possible for Russia to actually develop the Far East if it doesn't actually open up to the local populations, local actors 
setting a stronger agenda and actually to some degree allowing a, a more federal kind of Russian development. Uh, Emily, do you want to take that? Um, sure. I mean, I think I think that's exactly what is needed, really, because um, some of the biggest problems you see and some of the greatest tensions happen when um, the Kremlin will install a governor that is not from that region, um, that has no historic ties, um, that doesn't know what important industries operate there, that doesn't have any kind of local businesses that they've got good links with. I mean, sometimes there are security reasons why Russia does that. So in, in, in places like Dagestan, trying to install um, a governor who is, uh, you know, from Moscow rather than part of one of the clan networks in the southern region is obviously designed to break up a lot of those relationships. And I suppose that makes sense from a security perspective. But in places like the Far East, um, aside from, you know, I guess there's presumably some political reason why they, they don't do that, but installing somebody from Moscow into those regions just creates such a lot of tension. Um, and I certainly agree there's a, there's a real duality of agenda because on the one hand, um, you know, the message from the Kremlin is we need investment from China and we need these businesses, but at the same time, the Kremlin will openly support um, a lot of these kind of conspiracy theories that Natasha mentioned um, in her presentation earlier about Chinese immigrants flooding the region and taking people's jobs. And there's no real sense that I get that the Kremlin is trying to dispel any of those myths or reduce any of those tensions. Um, so it's very hard to understand what, what their end game is for the region. So if I think they don't give uh, not just regional governors, but the rest of the municipal councils and regional administration and you know the people of that region, any kind of say in how their region should be developed. And if all of these are coming from these top down imposed structures from Moscow, um, I think inevitably it, it's going to fail. Um, so whether that's something that I think a few government departments and a few individuals in government do actually recognize, um, and I get the sense that there are people that, that agree with that view, um, whether those voices actually uh, win out in the end, um, I think just still remains to be seen, unfortunately. Natasha, did you want to? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the only thing I'd say is really, um, yeah, to agree with what Emily said, but also, you know, this idea of the region becoming a dual periphery. Um, so, you know, completely kind of cut off in a way from Moscow. I mean, whether irrespective of whether you impose a governor from Moscow on them, um, essentially, uh, they feel very remote, you know, psychologically, I think, from Moscow, but, um, you know, and also in a way from the Asia Pacific, but at the same time, you could argue that, you know, there's a kind of residual Chinese soft power, just in the sense that, you know, if you live in Blagoveshinsk, you can just pop over the border and people do to go shopping in high hair, um, you know, uh, people have apartments there, some people are, take, you know, pensioners are going to live there and drawing their pensions there, you know, a bit like UK residents used to go and live in Spain back in the day, you know, because it was ch uh, cheaper to live there. Um, so, you know, it's, um, so people are kind of maybe just going to, people just kind of can go over to China, do shopping and so on and sort of see that actually, you know, China isn't really a threat, you know, on a kind of everyday, day-to-day -day basis, um, you know, but essentially also, um, you know, their needs are not really being attended to, I think, by the central authorities. Um, I don't think they really believe that Moscow cares much about them. Um, so, um, you know, or, or only in, as a kind of secure, in a kind of security sense, and then, um, you know, as a kind of defense, uh, maybe against China and others. Um, but I don't know that they really uh, feel that Moscow does care about them. And I think we saw at one point, you know, the Creole Islanders, um, you know, were suggesting, well, perhaps we should just become part of Japan because, you know, then we might get a chance at a better standard of living, um, at least. Um, I mean, I think there has been some money put into the Creole Islands now, but um, that's another interesting uh, case, case study, if you like, where, you know, we see that actually um, Moscow hasn't done very much at all in terms of, um, you know, developing um, the kind of economic life of their citizens, really.
um, but they have improved the military infrastructure on those islands in the last few years. Thank you so much. And unfortunately, I think our time has uh, come to an end today, but I'd like to thank both Natasha and Emily for really enlightening us on, on this uh, important region. And uh, I mean, I think it, it does highlight that when we're looking at Russia, it, it is very important to look beyond the Kremlin and look beyond Moscow, if you want to understand some of the strategic challenges the country is facing, but also how uh, parts of Russia also play into much wider foreign and security policy agendas, not least now Asia Pacific, the Arctic, uh, Indo-Pacific. And th these are some of the issues that we're going to be looking at in both in the Russia and the world program, which, which Emily is leading, but also in our, our new Indo-Pacific program, uh, both of which have been set up recently, uh, where we'll be returning to some of the issues also that Natasha is talking about, about Japan's key relationship, uh, where the Far East and the Kuril Islands have been central to the wider relationship to, to Russia. So if you would like to learn more about that, then please do visit our, our website and, uh, and see some of the upcoming programs. Uh, but until then, I'd just like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. Thank you.